All right, uh, a very good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Axel Threlfall, editor-at-large at Reuters, based out of London. Uh, I'm, I'm really thrilled to be hosting uh, this uh, opening uh, plenary under the, the theme, Catalyzing the Benefits of Globalization. I think the, the organizers have pulled together uh, a really rich uh, agenda over the next couple of days. So hopefully this will kick us off uh, in an inspirational fashion, or at least uh, give us plenty of, of food for thought. Um, just a few words. I'll keep this very brief, and I want to jump straight into our discussion. We have been debating for quite a while now the apparent unraveling uh, of globalization. In the course of this, uh, I, I guess, this hand-wringing, we've spent a great deal of time identifying its weaknesses, uh, the downsides of globalization. We've also spent a great deal of time uh, discussing uh, and defending uh, the benefits of globalization, however uneven those benefits might seem uh, to many people. We've also spent time trying to better understand the backlash against globalization and how domestic policies and international policymaking and cooperation uh, can, can help uh, make globalization more inclusive and fairer to all. And, and it's this last bit that, uh, that we're going to focus on this evening and indeed that uh, you're going to focus on for the next uh, couple of days. What are the best bits, uh, the bits that work in the interests of, of everyone? And how can we, how should we uh, rejig, uh, rethink, reposition the system uh, to work in a fairer way. Let me, let me introduce our panel. I'm going to keep this, as, as I said, as, as conversational as I can. I'll run for a little bit, and then I do want to throw it out to you. There's some roving mics for your questions, and I know everyone here is happy uh, to take your questions as well. So let's really make the most of the next uh, hour. Uh, to my right um, is Jerzy Kwiszczynski, Minister of Investment and Economic Development from Poland. Welcome, uh, Minister. Uh, to my left, uh, Michael Brown, uh, Senator for the District of Columbia, fresh in from D.C., and uh, Manuel Aitua is Minister of Science, Technology, and Higher Education uh, here in Portugal. Welcome to, to all of you. Uh, Minister, let, let me kick it off uh, with you with a, with a broad question, and do use this first broad question to, to, to set out your agenda, if you like. W will a tweak here and a tweak there um, be enough to restore people's faith in globalization? Or do you think, Minister, we are now w too far down the road of disillusionment, of, of cynicism, uh, and we require something a little bit more radical? <clears throat> you know, I, I can hear from your question that, you know, the perception of globalization is not, not as it was 10 or 20 years ago. You know, 20 years ago, it was quite a notion of uh, of, of positivism, you know, so it was quite positive. Now, say, in, in many countries, in many businesses as well, in societies, it's, it's perceived a little bit like a dungeon, not necessarily as a process uh, to which brings positive uh, results. So uh, I think that uh, either we, we, should, we should change the perception of that or maybe we should use other terms or other processes in order to, to better explain it. But, you know, I would like to give you the example of Poland because I think it, it, uh, this is what, of course, I know because I come from Poland. But I, I think that this is ex extremely useful, you know, for other countries which are gathered, you know, which are gathered here. Uh, in, in fact, uh, 30 years ago, Poland left the communist system in 1989 uh, due to the, such a special round table of trade unions and uh, say form a communist uh, government. We managed to, uh, to come to agreement and the transformation process started in Poland. That was 4th of June 1989. Just after that, you may remember at the end of this year, uh, uh, the famous iron wall fell in, in Berlin mm. between West and, uh, and East in Berlin. So this process started. And at that point of time, uh, Polish, uh, Polish GDP 
uh, per capita was, was less than $2,000 you know, per capita. Nowadays, this year, it should be 33,000. Uh, so, so that is several times bigger than it was at that time. Our trade at that point of time was just about 20 billion US dollars. Now it's more than 400 50 uh, billion US dollars. Mm. But I think the most rem remarkable is, is the comparison between countries. And I will give you two examples. One is the Portugal, where we are here, the, the member of the European Union, and, and the other one is the Ukraine, our, our neighbor. Uh, and uh, uh, and uh, Portugal is perceived as an old member state, so one of these member states which has a solid ground here within the you know, uh, European community. And, and this year we equalize, uh, you know, by the strength of our economy with Portugal. Mm. Last year we overpassed Greece. Ad another target for Poland will be then uh, Italy. And I think we will achieve it because our country is growing 5%, so it's growing no, a little bit less than China and, and India. But but more or less uh, at the same level like, like many you know, African countries. So I would say we can, we can work, we can cooperate with Portugal on equal foot, although uh, you know that our population is almost four times bigger. We are almost as open as Portugal. Portugal uh, exports, uh, you know, to <coughs> export to GDP is around 45%. Uh, percent. This is what I learned from my colleague, Mr. Vieira, Mr. Foy, uh, Mr. and Deputy Prime Minister, you know, of Portugal. We talked about that last year. So we can on equal foot, you know, dis discuss with each yep. Uh, yep. other. And, and Polish relation to the, uh, the relation of exports to GDP is about 50 percent. And, you know, another example, Ukraine. We were together in, in communist bloc at that time. And GDP in 1989 of Ukraine was, was higher because also the population of Ukraine was higher. But in, in, in terms of GDP per capita, it was, even, it was also higher in the case of Ukraine. And now GDP of Ukraine is nominally six times lower. In PPP terms, it's four times you know, lower. And that happened over 30, 30 years. And what helped us? Of course, good economic policy, the change of the direction from the east, you know, to the, to the west, presence in the EU, so being a, being a member of the European Union, so being a member of, 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 of a very good community, and openness to the world. Yeah, okay, I'm gonna stop you there. Um, Minister Ito, let me, I mean, it, your, your piece can be, if you like, in response to that as well. But, <coughs> but, but let me pose a, a, a similar question, whether, whether there's still enough of a recognition that, that, that the, the, the premise of globalization as we've known it for many, many years, um, whether, whether there's still a recognition that that is beneficial to our world. First of all, let me thank you, the organizers, for inviting me and uh, let me also strengthen the welcome remarks from the Deputy Mayor of Cascais to welcome you all to Portugal and to, and to Cascais. Certainly, this is the correct place to discuss the future and new horizons for our societies. I would like to address your questions, particularly not discussing globalization per se, because we know that we live under a quite global society for many, many, many decades, but essentially addressing what is changing, particularly in an ever-changing context where, uh, above all, over the last decades, uh, the emergence of a process of digital transformation is accelerating the process. We uh, can use and should use the global context under which um, we live. And I will bring the key question of globalization in a fast-changing um, environment is that of diversification of our attitudes, but also of a diversified context under which uh, or under which we need to face 
the issue of globalization. What does that mean, either in terms, we have just uh, heard from the Polish minister, either in terms of an European context, but also open to north, south, eastern, western reflection. We are essentially discussing a rapid changing environment where competitiveness and cohesion are difficult issues to bring together, but are probably the most challenging um, uh, context for political and participatory actions of um, business um, actors, public and private actors uh, at large. So how far can we bring together in a global and um, economic context uh, tools for improve cohesion and, co and competitiveness, particularly, particularly uh, with the goal to bring to the center of activities those which have typically um, been in the margin of economic development. The hypothesis I would like to bring on the table is uh, the challenges of bringing together a better um, inclusive society through cohesion and competitiveness can only be done with knowledge. And this is an hypothesis which has not been always like that in a global, um, in a global context. And therefore, the, um, the key question in my view, either from a political point of view or an academic point of view, or even a business point of view, is how can we um, address knowledge to create um, better and more employment everywhere, anywhere. And this relation between knowledge production and diffusion and job creation has become particularly critical, and for instance, in the, in the last World Economic Forum and Davos and the World Economic Forum 2018 report on the future of jobs, is very clear for the very first time in identifying that in a fast-changing digital context, job creation or drivers of job creation um, can only be achieved through four main um, uh, issues in the coming, say, five to ten years. First, looking seriously at the weakness of mobile um, internet. Second, at the process that we are increasingly transformed data, particularly using what we usually call by artificial intelligence type of uh, systems and technologies. Third, the way we can communicate to population those um, the data uh, transformers, um, particularly through big data analytics. Last but not least, the advent of emerging advanced computing facilities, mm. particularly from <coughs> a business point of view, but certainly also from a um, scientific and educational um, point of view. And if we look at the main drivers of job creation as identified by the World Economic Forum, it is particularly important in my view to better understand the compromises between cohesion and competitiveness, particularly looking at north-south, south-north divide, but also eastern-western um, relationships at the world level. I can later on um, go deeper into the Portuguese context in the Atlantic. How can we address the digital transformation process, particularly looking at the positioning of Portugal in Europe, but also our Atlantic window for South-North, North-South cooperation, particularly also in a transatlantic um, context. But I will address okay. that. Okay, okay. Minister, thank you very much indeed. And yeah, we will, we will come back to that. My, Michael, let me just throw it to you, to, for you to set the stage with a question, a, a big question along the lines of how, um, th how under threat is the, the, rule, the rules-based international order in light of what we've seen come out of the US and indeed other nations over the past couple of years. Um, you know, we, we need America to be engaged with the world is a message that we get over and over from, from leaders everywhere. Um, is it, is it, are you more optimistic now uh, that, 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 that America will engage, or is it getting worse? No, I, I think I am more optimistic. I think that we've seen signs of this. Uh, one of the problems for Americans is that um, we're, we're, we're committed to the idea, I think, of globalization, but it's hard for us to deal with the reality of it. Uh, only 75 years ago, after the Second World War, the United States 
was economically and militarily more powerful than the next 10 countries put together. We're starting, we're, we're looking for our, the way we fit into globalization. We're used to being uh, the leaders and uh, so cooperation is not always easy for us. Um, you know, I, I think about the fact that uh, I have adult children now and I will always want to tell them what to do and it's hard for me to accept the reality that I can't anymore. And even though that's patriarchal and maybe even condescending a little bit, that's where Americans stand right now and this has been what's fueled the rise in populism in the United States. Because this is a very old political canard, you know, is to say our problems are really based on on uh, things like immigration. We see this with, with our president who wants to build a wall and wants to back out of trade agreements. But we see lately that he's having a very, very hard time with this. When he campaigned for president, his number one of his number one campaign promises was to reform NAFTA, the, the uh, North American Free Trade Agreement. This has been stalled in Congress. Congress is now, they, they, he, he negotiated a, um, uh, an agreement with Canada and Congress is refusing to endorse it. It has to be endorsed by Congress because of the tariffs that he's put on aluminum and steel. So we're seeing pushback now for the first time uh, in a while uh, when it comes to policies that, if, that you know, would, would have America interact with the rest of the world. And still today, we have to realize that 40% of GDP, world GDP today, is uh, from the United States and China, those two countries. Yeah. So we're trying to find our position in the world right now. And I think that we're coming up with the, we're, we're finally come to the realization, yes, that we have to be world actors. We're looking at things like uh, uh, global climate change and understanding that no single nation can resolve this problem and that it's gonna take a worldwide effort and it's gonna take our cooperation and in fact, it's gonna take our leadership. Who, who, who's in charge of the international world order right now? Who's in charge of the international world order? Well, we think we are. Right. You know, we, we've always <laughs> felt that way, right? We, 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 we're, you know, uh, look, it, it's amazing to come to a conference like this and talk to people and, and, and see that most educated people in the world are multilingual. In the United States, hardly anybody speaks two languages, unless they came originally from somewhere else. People that have PhDs, uh, my, my sister has a PhD, my brother has a PhD, they only speak English. We are, because that's, you know, that's what, what we think. If, mm -hmm. if you want to deal with us, learn how to, how to communicate with us. We don't need to communicate with you. But that's changing. It's changing rapidly. Yep. So, okay. uh, you know, I think that, that uh, you'll see. And, and when we talk about things like job creation, we're seeing now that the numbers just came out yesterday uh, for uh, unemployment in March, and, and it was down. Uh, again, uh, February it flipped up and there was some concern about that. So we're starting to see some of the benefits that we get and technology, of course, is bringing us all closer yep. together. Yep. All right, all right, thank you, Michael. Um, Minister, back to you. Do you agree, by the way, that the US is in charge of the international world order? Uh, for, for how many years? <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right. Let me get back. I want to get. I, wanna, I don't want to stray too far away from the premise of this of this discussion. You know, ca catalyzing, capitalizing on the benefits of globalization. How 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 should established parties incorporate the fear of globalization, which we see in countries including your own, um, into their agendas? H how should they do that? Should there be a better communication? Of, and you talked about communication in your piece at the start. Should there be a better communication? Uh, should this start earlier? What, how, 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 should, how, how, how should this be done? I think this is, uh, this is one of the crit critical points, communication, and I think cooperation with media. I will give you two examples, I mean European examples, uh, because uh, what, what we did recently, uh, uh, we prepared and negotiated uh, two, two trade agreements. 
One was uh, with Canada. It covered also investment mm. called, called CETA. And another one was with Singapore. And, you know, and, uh, there was a lot of discussion also in the media about uh, CETA. And that provoked societies in the, I would say, the most developed countries. So these were not societies uh, which immediately started to, uh, to contest this deal. Uh, societies like whether in Poland, in Hungary, in, in Slovak Republic, but societies of Germany, of Austria, these were the, the society which, which uh, really put it in the question, mm. this, this trade and investment agreement uh, with, uh, with, uh, with Canada. And of course, the, you know very well the doubts about the agreement with the United States. Another, another example was with Singapore which was done very quietly. Media were not very much interested. And that was processed pretty quickly. So, so I'm saying by that, that it a lot depends on communicating, yeah. how the media especially, yeah. you, you know, present that. So you, as the fourth power, you have enormous power, mm. even sometimes bigger than, than we do, as, you know, as politicians, in order, you know, to influence them the attitude of the society. Is, is, there, a, is there a new form of, 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 of globalization that can, on the, on the one hand, appeal more to a populist electorate, while at the same time, one that benefits from economic liberalism and the benefits of globalization? Is there a, should we be talking about a new form of globalization here? No, I mean, certainly, be, I mean, we in Europe, we, we, we have been very much uh, concentrated on our issues. In, the, in, in America, in the United States, they are even more, mm. I would, you know, uh, 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 I would say. But, you know, in, in this world, we have the societies living in Asia. Asia is progressing. But also in Africa, there is much, much more to do. So, I mean, globalization uh, sounds completely different in different countries. I mean, what, what Minister was saying about globalization, you know, in Europe, when things like digitalization, artificial intelligence, big data, Internet of Things, these things are extremely important about that. But w when you talk to, uh, to our partners in Africa, well, you know, they are saying, we need some jobs, yeah. any jobs, yeah. Yeah. especially in the agriculture. We want to sell our product. And so th these are the problems. So the problems are different. So when we talk about the globalization, we cannot use the same words, you know, in uh, every part of the world. I, I guess, okay, thank you, Minister. Is it, is it a stark choice, though, you know, to that point, and, and what you said before, uh, Minister Aitor, is, is it a stark choice between free trade and protectionism, between technology and jobs, between uh, immigration and national identity. Is, is, this, is it this, this clearly delineated now? Is this, is this the choice we face? Uh, are these yeah. the choices we face? Thank you for the question. Certainly these are complex issues, but we should particularly look at the, the leading example of Europe in this, um, in this regard. Certainly in an increasing global a context, particularly for global economic uh, integration of our society, it is clear that what has also changed over the, the last years was particularly based on nationalists and national movements, which in some way are a contradiction to, uh, towards the increasing um, uh, globalization process that we live on and where we educate future uh, generations. And this certainly calls for the social context under which globalization is ever-changing and is evolving. So more in my view that say or identify a new or a, a new or a old paradigm is essentially to, to look at this rapid changing environment where again, where again the digital transformation process is also helping either in terms of ethical or national um, movements and the way either to do political activity or business activity or to create jobs is particularly different. And at the end of the day, looking also at the climate change issue, we need to place in a better 
social context, the way to create jobs everywhere. If we look at migrations in the Middle East to and across the Mediterranean, at the end of the day, they were, they were particularly caused by the impact of climate change on, on very specific um, agro-business and agriculture um, contexts. In, in, in the, in, and therefore, we certainly need to better understand the, the, a better compromise between economic development and environmental protection, which, which cannot be addressed anymore by the traditional institutions and institutional context under which. Actually, a report presented by the OECD one month ago um, here in Cascais was very clear in calling our attention for the, a process of institutional innovation in order to facilitate collaborative arrangements between public and private and between different business mm -hmm. sectors in order <coughs> to facilitate, again, the idea that the social context under which global activities are, in, are faster and faster need to face the challenge of creating jobs everywhere um, so that we can accommodate the feelings, the attitudes of population at, at um, large, and particularly bringing to the global context those which has been systematically on the margins mm. of the process of job creation. And this is a key issue which is changing the way political activity has been done, and yep. we are facing these movements in Europe um, uh, throughout um, Europe, but particularly, particularly activated under the Brexit context. Yep. And therefore, the new, the new European landscape is calling our attention, particularly when we look at the future generation. Okay, thank you. I, I don't know if you've got all of that. We're getting a little bit of an echo here. But, but you know, with that in mind, and jobs and, and the focus, there, ha, wh where is the Polish government focusing its resources now when it comes to... When it comes to uh, perhaps repositioning, rediverting, rejigging this, this whole agenda? You know, it's interesting, but in fact, you know, on this inclusive growth. So that, that's... that's oh, on the inclusive growth. Exactly, yeah. on the in inclusive growth. So our, our major, uh, major priority is that, you know, that the benefits of the growth are spread over the society. Uh, and independently whether they live in urban or in rural areas, whether they, you know, they are economically strong or, or weak, to spread the benefits. And, uh, you know, the last, especially two, three years, uh, this year showed that this can work. You know, the, uh, the capacity of, of Poland in economic terms is set at about 3% level. So, you know, if we do nothing wrong, nothing very positive, and if there are no external shocks, we should grow at 3%. Hmm. But we are growing 5%. Two years and uh, two last years, this for this year should be also about 4.5, hmm. because there is some slowdown, you know, in, you know, in the European economy. But, you know, there were many measures, especially uh, directed to families, we, <coughs> which allowed us substantially reduce, for example, poverty by some 50% in, in two years. But amongst the families uh, with, with bigger number of children, three, four, five, the poverty was reduced in two years by 94%. Yeah. So, so, you know, uh, we are saying that, you, that, you know, this, this inclusive growth uh, brings benefits not only to these people, but also to the economy. Yeah. And, you, and you say the political will is there in Poland. Yeah, political will to do it is here. And what is interesting, you know, because in the steer of, of Polish government is, is the party considered as a conservative party. So that was not our predecessors, so more liberal parties, but the conservative party is, yeah. is really introducing the inclusive growth model to public. And, and the reason, uh, I'll come back to both of you in a second, but the reason I ask this, and apologies if this sounds a little bit provocative, but the, the, I talk about a political will to train, to educate, um, et cetera, et cetera. That, that there is this danger that, that, that populist leaders who promise quick fixes are part of the problem. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I think we have also problem with the term populism and populist. Because, you, you, you know, uh, I think that we should listen to the people. And is the person who is listening, you know, to the people and who is doing a lot for the people, is, is that person a populist? Mm. Uh, you know? Okay, okay, that's a good question, actually. And I'll put it, I'll put it to you. I mean, I, 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 same, same question, you know, this idea of populist leaders with quick fixes being part of the problem when, when you want to look at long-term uh, education and, and, and proper communication, as we talked about before. Um, this is a big problem in the U.S. Well, well, it is a big problem in the U.S., and it is a quick fix. And you ask if there's a trade-off between technology and, and, and you know, uh, globalization and how these things interact. Politically, in the United States, it's easy for populists to say this is globalization is our problem. You know, reaching out to the world is a is a problem. But this is again, it's waning very quickly. We've just seen one more example of the president of the United States saying we're going to shut down the border to Mexico. He backed off that two days ago because of the, our realization that this would harm the American economy as much as it would harm the Mexican economy. So we're, you know, we're, the, we're among the most educated people on the face of the planet, and we get it. But politically, there's this, we're, we're making a transition from a manufacturing economy to a technology economy. And you see- I think we, I think we, we got you. Is it, oh, yeah, we lost yeah, okay. it for a second, go ahead. Uh, and, and we've seen this many times before. I mean, you could go back to, the beginning of the Second World War, where we were isolationists, or the, the beginning of uh, you know, McCarthyism. There are many examples in American history where uh, as the economy changes, and as my colleague here says about job, job creation, as that changes, protectionism rears its ugly head. It has in America for a long time. And it works well in America because we've been in such a dominant position mm -hmm. over the years. But this is changing quickly, believe me. Uh, and uh, we've just seen uh, the House of Representatives flip in, in, in the favor of uh, Democrats uh, over the, the, against the populace. Uh, we've just seen, uh, as I say, the president back off on two of his major positions understanding that we can't stand alone against the world. Okay. Um, Minister Reiter, I wanna, we, we, we were originally going to have the, the Minister for Youth from Austria here, and, um, and, and one of the things I wanted to touch on, and maybe I can touch on, on this with you, one of the things I wanted to touch on with her were the youth goals that the Austrians were quite instrumental in, 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 in putting forward. Inspiring youth bringing youth on board, again, back to training, back to education, back to learning, back to proper communication uh, with youth. Um, how to inspire them? Um, how do governments think this through now? And of course, in your role, technology, an entrepreneurial spirit, um, investment into, into tech, web summit here in, in Portugal, et cetera, et cetera. I imagine this is one way to bring them in. Uh, that is certainly a very interesting question. And I believe once we have here particularly a business community and we know that the fast growing business today have those which particularly live out of educated people, the question is why? Why at large, particularly in Western societies, we usually educate only out of your, our youth, particularly when you look at our at tiger education. The average European value is about four out of each six um, um, youngsters of 20 years old are educated in universities and agri-education institutions. So we, we, we live we, and we are in a society where we left behind at least half of our kids. And that is probably one of the key issue that when we clearly address future generations, particularly looking at the current context of global versus national movements, we need to better understand how can we expand our education systems to bring again to the center of educated um, activities those which have traditionally left in the margins of those systems. 
And what we are doing in Portugal, step by step, we have put together a strategy for 2030 in a 12 years uh, process to move from four to six out of each 10 um, um, kids of 20 years old to be educated in agri-education can only be achieved throughout a, a quite diversified system. Hopefully our societies are different and therefore we need to answer with different and diversified contexts um, certainly in the type of education. And again, if we refer either to World Economic Forum or the most recent OECD analysis, the idea of diversifying education together with the way we do research, but particularly ad addressing short cycles, short training, um, and in a way that traditional education will be complemented by more and more new ways of educating people through um, on-job, through short cycles, through the digital context, under which, again, we need to build trust to population at large. In this country, over the last 20 years, apart from a stepwise process of educating people at large, we have also experiments, actually following others in Europe, the context of promoting the culture of doing science, the culture of, lo of learning, the, the culture of inquiring, in particular, through a network of science centers, nowadays spread <laughs> over the, the country, we have realized that most of our um, startups, most of those people engaging in startups, are those which, during their education cycle, they have been in some way, in some way, um, uh, asked to participate and engage in participating in uh, scientific culture activities in a way to learn how to inquire, how to question and to, and to essentially um, make questions that we don't know the answer. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the context of continuously engaging um, the youth and future generations to contexts which take people to inquire is particularly, I, I, I believe, the experience to share and to open up this experience to other contexts. Mm -hmm. How, and, how we, yeah, you, go ahead. Let me just add, and you should understand that in America, the, the, the younger people of America, the generation that's coming up, is more engaged with the world than we've ever been before. They're on a dozen different platforms. You have children in elementary school that, that all have mobile devices and computers and they're interacting with the world. So that's one of the things that's rapidly changing. And as much as we talk about America reaching out, the world needs to reach in as well. The Chinese, for example, are spending millions and millions of dollars in Washington, D.C., bringing Chinese culture into, into America. So Your government's watching very, that very, very closely. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes they very are. Closely. They're watching it very closely because they're, you know, we, we know for a fact the Russians interfere with our election and we're very, very suspicious. But there are countries that are making a big effort to uh, bring their culture into, into America. How are you engaging your youth? How are you inspiring your youth in Poland? No, I, I fully agree with Minister. I mean, education is the key for the future and, and that is uh, the, the, the most, uh, the, the, the this investment which is the most valuable you know for every country and we can see that also you know in our country for the moment uh, we have more than 50 percent of young people who are leaving the educational system these are people with higher education so 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 this is really a great benefit of putting education you know on the priority but we've got also the problems because these people are well educated mm -hmm. but they should get good job i will give you interesting uh, example you know the number of it experts in central europe so that counts for poland czech czech, czech republic slovakia ukraine and hungary is bigger than the number of it experts in the united states so I would say we have enormous capacity, mm. but you know the best people are leaving. That's, and this is not only the problem of Poland, of many other countries. You know, half of startups uh, which are created in Europe, they escape from Europe, and half of them that escape, 
they escaped to the United States. And we've got these families everywhere. My brother works for Microsoft in Seattle now, but before Amazon. He should have worked, you know, in Poland. Another very good Polish guy, Peter Szulczewski, he created one, one of the unicorns called Wish in few, few years time ago. It is worth some 15 billion, you know, US dollars. He should have done it in Europe and not in the United States. Mm. But why? No, there are better conditions, you know, for the development of such businesses elsewhere. And, you know, uh, such, such wonderful things, economically wonderful things, can happen in uh, other countries. When you go to Nairobi, to Kenya, you can pay everywhere by your mobile. Mm. You don't have to work to bring, you know, your cash. You, you don't have to bring, yep. you know, your credit cards. You can pay by mobile. So that happened, you know, in an African country. So that means, you know, that the clever people are everywhere. Uh, and uh, and uh, all the countries which uh, uh, put a lot of attention, you know, to education, and that's especially visible in Europe, they, uh, they, they can really benefit from that mm -hmm. investment. What, you know, we, we've talked, I'm wary of the time, and I, I do want to get to your questions. We, we've talked about some of the benefits. What, what, as far as you're aware, as far as you're concerned, what are some of the things that are not working well right now? Well, I think that, that there's a, a misunderstanding uh, in the United States about what globalization means. And some of the things that aren't working are um, dominance, for example, by the Chinese. We're very suspicious of what this is doing to our economy. Um, so that's not working. But what is working is cooperation with some of our neighbors, mm -hmm. like the Canadians and the Mexicans. They're now integrated into our economy and they're both playing very, very important roles. But I think we're, we're, again, because we're used to being dominant, we're very suspicious of things like Alibaba and, yep. and you know, some of the technology things that, that uh, are coming from the, from the Far East and Europe. Uh, but uh, I think, you know, the things that we, we when we reach out, um, I think that we're convinced that globalization yeah. is, is something that we need to embrace. And you know what? The next horse's <coughs> national, international meeting should be somewhere, in, maybe it should be in Iowa yeah. or Colorado yeah. or someplace yeah. in the United States so that we bring uh, the, the globalization uh, argument into or, or, or uh, you know, pitch into the United States rather than having us be reactive. Be active. Is it, do you see the, 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 the re reinvigoration of world trade through multilateralism now? Is that the best way forward? Or, or, or was it going to be increasingly well, you unilateral? Know, Amer America at heart has always been free traders. So certainly uh, that plays a very important role. Yeah. And, and you know, we like to think of ourselves as a democracy first, but really we're capitalists first. So uh, anything that provides jobs, that provides a growing economy will be quickly embraced. Mm. Minister. Thank you very much again for um, bringing this to the issue because multilateralism is on crisis. And it is clear that uh, the um, uh, last years were very, um, were, were very critical in emphasizing um, the debt issue. And we sincerely hope that the new when Secretary General Antonio Guterres can strengthen this context and open, actually, with a number of lessons, particularly from, again, those which typically have become in the margin, either in Africa or in Asia, that we can learn how to um, improve and strengthen multilateralism, again, in a way to bring together tools and political and economic incentives to bring together cohesion and um, um, competitiveness. Let me give you an example of Portugal in the Atlantic. Because when we look at global and global activities, and we are discussing here visions towards the next de decades, one issue is to, to look at Earth from space. And space activities and space-related systems are emerging 
giving rise to what we call new space industri industries, particularly, particularly in a way to create again new economic activities when particularly we look at the, the planet Earth from low orbit uh, type of satellites. And this is creating a completely new environment. We know about uh, the investments certainly in the United States and in China in this regard, but also in Europe. We are launching um, a, a new uh, strategy for uh, small satellites, particularly using um, our Atlantic uh, context and the zone of Azores for building up a new spaceport, and we have just launched the Azores International Satellite Launch Program, together a South-North, North South Cooperation in the Atlantic, in a way to better, to better look at economic development in Atlantic regions by also um, promoting uh, um, environmental preservation. So by changing the legal regime, mm -hmm. by implementing an institutional context, which certainly will not be put together through an intergovernmental organization, but more and more by institutional collaboratories, which will bring together business from different parts of the, the, the Atlantic <coughs> and building on the top of that a global partnerships program. It's a challenge to go, but we need to look at our planet and our economic activities from a different perspectives from urban development to biodiversity, to forest development, to precision agriculture, to autonomous shipping. These are space-driven activities which we hope to promote in the coming decade through an entrepreneurial spirit associated with ed educated people. Mm. All Thank right. you. Thank you, Minister. Um, look, let me, I want to throw it out to, I've, I've got a, plenty more I, I want to ask you, um, but I want to throw it out to our audience, see if there are any questions here. First, we've been jumping around quite a lot, but look, let's do that. Um, if there are any questions, just raise your hand. Yeah, there's a gentleman right here in the middle. I think we have a, a microphone. I think we have a microphone coming to you. Uh, yep, right here. Yep, gentleman right there. <clears throat>
part of the backlash that you see is a reaction to the fact that we have moved so fast on so many social including women who, by the way, never seem to be involved in any scandals. We're never, you know, we never catch them stealing money or, you know, I, I mean, right? Okay, now we're opening up another discussion. Okay, yeah. Michael, Sorry. thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Uh, Minister, final comment from you, please. Uh, no, I, I agree with that. For me, the key thing will be, you know, the education. The, the education which promotes creativity, which is now, you know, not always the case. Second thing, I think it's extremely important that the, the media would like to create new leaders. The problem with media is that they usually have very strong preferences on, on one side, on another side. And the, the leaders you can create as leaders only when you have great diversity. And I fully agree, there should be a woman, not one, even more, on the stage. Yeah. All right. Um, look, I'm going to finish it there. I mean, we, we could go on and on, but this leads quite well, uh, quite nicely into, our, into the next session. Uh, Minister uh, Kwiecinski, uh, Michael Brown, uh, and Minister Aitor, my thanks to all three of you. And thank you to you thank for your you. questions. Thanks very much indeed.